Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you all to the plenary session of the International Symposium on Plant Taxonomy and Ethnobotany. First of all, I would like to request the chair, Dr. R. Prakash Kumar, director, TBGRI Kerala, co-chair, Mr. S. N. Tyagi, PCCF, retired, Gujarat State Forest Department, reporters, Dr. K. Kartigian and Dr. Dinesh Agarwala to take the charge and conduct the session. Thank you. <coughs> Respected delegates, experts, scientists of the country and outside the country, welcome to the plenary session of the International Conference on Taxonomy and Ethnobotany organized by the Planet Survey of India, Minister of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. We are running short of time, so straight away I am planning to go to the session. We have Four speakers with us, four eminent speakers, eminent botanists of the country. Duration 20 to 30 minutes for a lecture. We are planning to conduct this session and after, after each lecture, you know, after the complete lectures, we can have an interaction with the audience. Dear friends, I represent the Jawaharlal Nehru Tropical Botanical Garden and Research Institute, Paru, Kerala. It is also a committed center for biodiversity conservation and taxonomy research. I extend my greetings to you all in this function. We are also holding several research programs exclusively in taxonomy and biodiversity conservation, holding several fellowship schemes, projects, student projects, augmentation schemes and all. And currently, we have joined with the government of Kerala to start a flagship program on uh, planting almost 10 crores of natural food crops across the state. And we also have a huge repository of traditional knowledge in food and medicine as is related to thermobotanical studies. We have more than 40,000 information on traditional knowledge in food and medicine. And now we are in the lookout of setting up of a nodal center for uh, documenting all these. And as yesterday in the brainstorming session, someone was pointing out, in having, I think Dr. A.K. Pandey was pointing out that there should be an inter-ministerial discussion to have such programs. And I request the Ministry of Environment to join hands with the Ministry of Ayush is possible to have an inter-ministerial discussion for setting up of a national model center for documenting all this traditional knowledge information. With these few words, I invite the learned dignitaries to hold their plenary lectures. As I said earlier, we have all the learned uh, uh, botanists of the country, Dr. A.K. Cole. He is a renowned botanist of the country and served in Agra University and also in Jammu Kashmir University. Has published as a botanist more than 300 research papers in reputed journals. He was the sessional president of the Indian Science Congress Association and the president of the Indian Botanical Society at IAG. Currently, Dr. Cole is the chairman of the Research Assessment and Monitoring Committee of the Botanic Survey of India. I respectfully invite Dr. A.K. Cole to deliver his lecture on plant taxonomy, user perspective of the changes required. Dr. Cole, please.
fellow delegates. I feel happy and privileged to be amongst the galaxy of taxonomists gathered here from within the country and outside. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all experts in taxonomy, the oldest branch of biology which has served humankind for several centuries. But for you and your science, the house of biology would have been a jungle. It's not providential, nor is it coincidental that this conference is being held at the beginning of the new decade. Obviously, the organizers had it in mind that it would help them draw the roadmap for the new decade. What has surprised me is that a person who cannot claim to have any expertise in taxonomy but has been a user of taxonomy all his life and who admires and appreciates the importance of taxonomy has been asked to deliver the keynote address. I have been a user of taxonomy, as I said already, and the address will be a user's perception of present-day taxonomy. Lately, particularly during the last four or five years, taxonomy has come under very severe criticism, as I said in the morning. They are buying their taxonomy, a discipline that is devoted to imposing order in the living world, is itself vague and remarkably arbitrary. And therefore, how can it help in bringing order in the living world? They are going to the extent of proposing imposition of restrictions on the freedom of taxonomists by bringing taxonomy under the purview of the International Union of Biological Sciences, which is an umbrella body for biology within the International Council of Science. The experts collected here will do well to consider the perception of some of the users of taxonomy, discuss the issues, and find which are the areas of taxonomy that irks them. The latest onslaught on taxonomy has been waged by two Australian taxonomists, Stephen Garnett of Charles Darwin University and Les Christidis of Southern Cross and the paper that they have published is in Nature, June issue of Nature, 1997. 
they say that vagueness in taxonomy stems from lack of one definition of species, arbitrary delineation of species, frequent lumping and splitting of species, frequent name changes, and more than that, taxonomic vandalism, which involves self-published and non-e-reviewed works, which cause disruption to the foundations of taxonomy. And then they charge the scientific community and peers of taxonomy for having failed in government. The critics charge taxonomy for being used to living in the world of infirmities. They say that infirmities in taxonomy are there right from the time of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, in his classic book on the origin of species, wrote, and I quote, no one definition of species has satisfied all naturalists. Yet, every naturalist vaguely knows what he means when he speaks of a species. And this state of affairs continues till this day. Little has changed since then, and this outlook continues. On the contrary, the social needs have changed, but not the goalposts of the farm. The plant names and true identification of species of plants and animals was never required as much as it is now. Today, the assumption that species are static and fixed underlies so many things, like every international agreement on biodiversity conservation is based on the static status of the species. All environmental legislation, all efforts to safeguard plants and animals, all laws concerning protection of endangered species are all based on the static, the concept of static nature of species. Friends, there can be no dispute in agreeing that vagueness and law are incompatible. They cannot go together. And therefore, we need to take cognizance of what the critics say. Taxonomists are unmindful of the changes they frequently made in plant names. They are accountable to none other than their peace. But the society pays a great deal for such changes. Such changes threaten efforts 
to halt biodiversity loss. They threaten and damage the credibility of science. And they prove expensive to the society. These arguments have started changing the perception of common man about the usefulness of taxonomy to biodiversity, inventorization, and conservation. Taxonomists here reject the proposal of bureaucratization for good reason. Since June 2017, at least six papers have appeared in Nature and many more in journals devoted to taxonomy, rejecting the charge that or the, the rejecting the proposal that the freedom of taxonomists must be curbed by bringing taxonomy under the purview of the International Union for uh, Biological Sciences. Well, this is something that we should do. A recent paper appeared, not so recent, paper appeared in 1998 in Pros Biology, which has been authored by as many as 172 taxonomists from across the world. But for some reason, no Indian taxonomist has contributed that, to that paper. And this, the substance of the paper is a defense against bureaucratization of the song. But we are right in resisting bureaucratization, but at the same time, we cannot trivialize the issues that have been raised by less and by others. They need to be considered and addressed in conferences such as this. One thing that we need to work upon is that we must make an attempt to reconcile the rules and regulations of taxonomy with laws and legislation regarding biodiversity conservation, trade in legally protected plants, and in biosecurities. And the sooner we do it, the better it will be both for our science as also for our society. The Science of taxonomy is also being charged for being slow. And for which reason? They say in, it cannot help in protection of virus. The rate of inventorization of biological diversity is claimed to be much slower than the rate of species loss. And this assumes greater significance in view of E. W. Wilson's often quoted biodiversity forecast in which he says half of all plant and animal species will reach extinction by the year 2100. 
as true guardians of biodiversity, it is obligated for our community to fulfill the twin tasks of inventorization and conservation of biodiversity. Traditional methodology that is used in taxonomy cannot help in achieving the goal of inventorization. It is estimated that the number of species, number of years, that will be required to identify the hitherto unidentified eukaryote species will be somewhere around 1,000 years. And in strong, strong contrast, the number of years that will be required to identify them using DNA barcode will be about 20 years. So why is it that we do not make attempts to standardize the barcoding technique. Barcoding has, DNA barcoding has many other advantages, as most of you would know. But for the benefit of the younger members of the audience, I would like to say that it is cost effective. And it has been estimated that you require to spend just $3 to barcode a specimen. The sample size required is very small and species can be identified at any stage of their life cycle, seed, seedling, adult plant, in the reproductive or in the vegetative phase and so on. In dioecious species, we can identify species from either of the two genders. It can help in detection of, in, in, in uh, identification of cryptic intraspecific variability. And it can help in identification of hundreds of years old herbarium specimens and music, her herbarium sheep and music specimens. But barcoding has serious limitations. And the most serious limitations of limitation of barcode is, DNA barcode is, that the plants are not amenable to DNA barcoding as the animals are. Only multicellular algae and fungi can successfully be barcoded. So at least those two groups we can straight away start with. And in the meantime, all efforts should go into developing modifications and trying to find out how far chloroplast DNA can help in uh, achieving the goal. And the second problem with DNA barcoding is that it cannot help in the identification of new species. It can help in the identification of the species already known. Where it can help taxonomists is in the delineation of species, just as we use GPS, global positioning system, in placing ourselves geographically. The same way we can use DNA barcode for placing the variants in natural populations. And once the variant has been identified, it can then be described by normal methodology of taxonomy. Luckily, the barrier between traditional taxonomists and the barcoding scientists has given way. And now, 
they accept DNA biology and they realize that their fears that with the establishment of DNA biology, the traditional taxonomy would lose. But now it has been realized the world over that DNA barcode would invigorate the form and not deepen it. And this was very beautifully portrayed by the frontispiece in nature where Linus, since photograph Linus was shown to be carrying the DNA bar for the first time. The other charge against taxonomy is that taxonomy is not integrated. You know, historically, taxonomists have been used to working alone, going to wilderness, staying alone, collecting plants and describing. Unlike scientists in the field of particle physics or high energy physics or astronomy, where they have to work in huge groups dispersed in many countries to come out with facts. But taxonomists have to realize that with the change in the goalpost of taxonomy, a culture of cooperation and not culture of conflict and confrontation is likely to pay the dividends. That taxonomy is not integrated is evident from the conflict between systematics and biosystematics. Although the concepts on which systematics and biosystematics are based are complement. They are not contradictory. Traditional taxonomy is based on phenotypic variability. And biosystematics is based on biological, uh, is based on reproductive isolation. And both phenotypic variability and reproductive isolation emerge from genetic diversity. So there is no room for contradiction. The dream to bring about a synthesis of systematics and biosystematics does not see sight still. Expeditionary and traditional taxonomy is fundamental. It cannot be done in a way. But the way, I may be excused, excused to say, the way it is being done at the moment, it leaves much to be desired. Most of the field work in taxonomy these days is being carried out by students, scientists, except for the scientists of BSI, hardly ever go to the field for collection, for description, and so on. Without taking the name of the university, I would give you an idea of what is happening in traditional taxonomy these days. What has happened to him?
Man, you spoke. I didn't do shit. Don't, don't stand around him. Don't stand around him. You spoke. You such a gate that we did for. Let him breathe. Deep breathing, करिए थोड़ा. Deep breathing. Can you help him? <coughs> Friends, I am sorry for the interruption. Let us all pray. For good health of a young friend, I was uh, trying to tell you that traditional taxonomy calls for changes. I was referring to an example. Of a PhD thesis submitted to a very prestigious university on 15 tropical genera, <coughs> and the review of this thesis showed. That nearly one third of the species described were from a single herbarium sheet, and the rest of them had been described by less than three from less than three sheets. This may be an extreme case, <coughs> but this situation prevails. The taxonomists need to consider: Isn't it time that we now try to collect, study, and describe species from their entire geographical range? Such work will call for long-term systematic research. LTSR, long-term systematic research, <clears throat> along the same lines as we have LTER, long-term ecological research. The ecologists already have it. The systematists, the taxonomists, need to fight to have this. This, perhaps. If it becomes a reality ever, it is likely to change the face of taxonomy. Friends, I would like to conclude by stating that there is no denial that no branch of biology is as intimately connected and relevant to biodiversity as is taxonomy. And this has been projected by a number of biologists of all shapes. But I feel personally impressed by what Robert May said towards the end of the last century. And I quote: "Without taxonomy to give shape to bricks." And systematics to tell us how the bricks have to be laid. 
the house of biological science is a meaningless job. It is time over the years, and you know this relationship between taxonomy and biodiversity boosted the status of taxonomy. But unfortunately, this perception has received a setback in view of the criticism leveled by conservation biologists in recent years. They say that, bio that taxonomy is not an aid, but an impediment in the inventorization and conservation of biodiversity. Friends, it is time that taxonomists seriously consider what Van Wright said again towards the end of last century, 1996 to be precise. He said that taxonomy does not have to be merely self-seeking, not merely more of same time-worn neck button dust as lamb, old wine, new bottles, but it has to be oriented outward towards society at large to fulfill our responsibilities as the guardians of bioresources and biodiversity. Thank you very much. Dear delegates, the first lecture is over. With immense pleasure, I invite Dr. Kane Gandhi, who is a senior nomenclature registrar at the Harvard University, Cambridge, USA, to deliver his 30 minutes lecture on plant nomenclature. Dr. Gandhi manages a botanical classification project in the Western world through his role at Harvard University. Currently, he is working on international plant name index, and besides, he is a nomenclature editor of the Harvard Purpose in Botany and so, so, many, so many other <coughs> duties. In brief, I should say that Dr. Gandhi has uh, received so many awards to mention a few. Distinguished Service Award from the American Society of Plant Taxonomies. He is the course director for Botanical Nomenclature Courses. Green Carpet Award, Distinguished Service Award, the Donovan Stewart Coral Memorial Award, to mention a few. I invite Dr. Gandhi to deliver his lecture, 30 minutes lecture. <laughs> My young and senior friends, I am here today to share a little bit of knowledge that I have acquired in the last 50 years. Since 1970, I have been doing taxonomic research and teaching. And in doing so, I have acquired knowledge in my personal experience and by interaction with eminent scholars. I'm not doing any, anything what we call rocket science, but in the course of doing what I do, given very fundamental things, very fundamental things, I came across that that were never explained to me when I was a student or I didn't explain when I was a teacher. And whatever I learn, I share it to share with the rest of the botanical community, not only in USA, 
but with a few selective European botanists and with more than 400 people in India, so that in turn they can share the same knowledge with the rest of the botanical community. Prior to coming here, I have spent about three and a half weeks visiting several parts of India, like Shillong, Assam, Kerala, Bangalore, and Calcutta again. And because of prayer family commitment, I need to depart to USA today only. Because of the tremendous effort, sorry, tremendous respect I have for BSI, I chose to remind to attend this morning's function and this afternoon, after the lunch, I will be leaving. I am sorry to leave, but as I said, I need to leave so, to attend a family event in USA. Now, since 2010, I have been coming to India since 2030, the Botanical Survey of India has organized four nomenclature workshops in different parts of India, like Calcutta, Pune, Paimato, Shillong. In the very beginning, that credit go to Dr. Sanjapa, who introduced me to BSI botanist. And Professor Sabu introduced me to many Indian botanists. Then other professors started inviting me, such as in, in St. Saint Xavier College, Mumbai, Marathwadi University, Baroda University, Calcutta University, Bangalore University. So things go on. What am I doing here? I am just sharing. I'm, I feel so happy to share my knowledge. And to share that knowledge, I need a venue, and these are the people who make that arrangement. And it requires a lot of effort from these organizers. Like if you are getting married, the groom has to just go and sit in the wedding hall. But their parents and other friends, they have to take so much effort to arrange that wedding. So I gave credit to all those organizers who have organized either one day event or five day event. So to give a sampling, I have been serving as a flora of North American flora as a nomenclature editor. And to some extent, I have been contributing to Floor of India as far as the nomenclature is concerned. And gradually the youngsters, they have been learning. In turn, they are spreading that knowledge. We have been talking about Floor of India. I just mentioned a little information about Floor of North America. John Torrey, the New York Botanical Chief Botanist, and Yesa Gray, who became the Harvard professor, often called the father of American botany. Together they started this project, Flora of North America, published two volumes during 1838 and 1842. For some inexplicable reason, the flora did not get completed. Then comes Yesa Gray, the Harvard professor, who started the synoptical flora of North America and started sometime in 1870s and continued to 1920s, but never completed. Meanwhile, Britain and his associates at New York Botanical Garden started with North American flora. It ran for a few decades, never completed. Finally, a group of people from USA and Canada organized together this committee, association, Flora of North America Association, and invited hundreds of botanists to contribute. 
These botanists not only come from North America, but also from Europe. Initially, it was John McMee, the chief editor of two botanical courts, who served as the chief, as the nomenclature editor for four of North America. When he became in charge of the botanical court, then they needed a nomenclature editor. John McMill invited me to serve as the editor. Since 2000, I have been serving. It's a voluntary work. It's a voluntary work. I'm not paid to be the editor. Likewise, everyone who has been contributing to Flora of North America is a volunteer. So all that, they are all working somewhere, whether as a paid employee in the university or a retired, but still, whatever knowledge they have acquired, they are sharing. I am paid to do some work at Harvard, whatever the pay is enough to me, and I share my knowledge with the botanical, with the flora of North America. I was very happy. I felt proud that they asked an Indian to be the non-creature editor. It's a, I feel, I mean, I'm not boasting, but I thought it's a pride to the Indian book. Quality education in India. We have already completed 21 volumes out of 30. In another two years, we'll complete the remaining nine volumes. The deadline was to complete that in 2018, but it was not possible. Probably by 2022 or 23, we'll complete the remaining. Why we cannot complete it on time? It's all voluntary work. We are not, I mean, the floor of North America is not paying anyone to do that work. We are all doing voluntary work from different institutions. So we have commitments, but still we are contributing. So now, as a nomenclature editor, I also need to contribute the etymology of generic name. And I try my level best. The relevant specialist may not know the real meaning of certain botanical terms. Here was a legume genus called Andira, which Lamarck published. Lamarck published. And he said that the term Andira was derived from the Portuguese term, a common name in Brazil, called Angeli. Even though I was familiar with the Sanskrit term also used in Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada or Hindi, Anjali, I didn't make any connection with that term. I merely contacted the Portuguese botanist in Brazil. Hey, what does Anjali mean? They merely said something graceful, something Anjali. Since two Portuguese botanists mentioned that Anjali means graceful, I took it for granted that is the correct meaning. So I told the specialist for floor of North America, let us use that the tree is very tall, graceful. So the term Andira is referring to the appearance of the tree, the form of the tree. But one day later, a very senior botanist from Brazil told me, Kanchi, they call me as Kanchi. Kanchi, no. The young botanists in Brazil are wrong. The term came from India. The Portuguese who landed in Kerala, they learned the term Anjali for autocorpus hirsutas, a wood that was used to make boats. And in Brazil, they used the wood of Andira to make boats. It is the same Portuguese who came to India and the same Portuguese who went to Brazil. So in Brazil, they speak Portuguese. So now, it is given in the Portuguese dictionary that this is a borrowed term from India. So the Port young Portuguese botanists in Brazil, they were stunned. They didn't know because they didn't take the time to refer to the dictionary. I was very glad that an Indian term was borrowed in Brazil. An Indian term is used. So what that Anjali, term Anjali means? Again, coming back to the Sanskrit term, one of the, one of the meaning is 
something offering to the divinity why you are offering when you are joining two hands you are making something like the inner surface the upper surface is a shallow cavity if you refer to any dictionary sanskrit dictionary one of the meanings of anjali is cavity so here is a boat which is having a shallow cavity on the inner surface so the auto corpus resultus was made to use to make boats that's what andiro was used simple meaning anjali one of the meanings of the term anjali is the cavity so that's what i provided for floor of north america this meaning you will not find in any book i am telling you but this is what is going to be published in the forthcoming volume what are i meant to cartilidan i learnt the term cartilidan dicartilidan monocartilidan in the year 1961 when i was a ninth standard student in bangalore high school but i didn't know what cartilidan meant i assume unless you have heard my talk before you are not going to give me the literal meaning of the term cartilidan american botanists didn't know european botanists didn't know it is not a rocket science the meaning is available but we never paid attention to learn it when i was supposed to give the etymology for the genus name hydrocotai everyone knows hydro the linear sense of the genus author mentioned total means cavity and he was describing the leaf a peltate leaf which was looking like a ball and the inner surface is a shallow cavity and that's what the greek the greek term cotyl means and it goes back to dioscorides who introduced the term cotyl in like in greek so the literal meaning cartilidan cotyl is cavity so when we say dicartilidan we are referring to two cartilages likewise monocartilidan single cavity why cavity a cartilidan structure in the sea because to someone the structure of the cartilidan in a sea look like in the roundish form reminding the a ball so they gave the term when once it is given it got stuck it doesn't matter that the relevant structure in the sea is not looking like a cavity but the term was given it is it's it got stuck that's what we continue to use this i have been telling this is what we are using for floor of north america and i passed this knowledge to many american botanists to many european botanists and to more than 400 indian botanists several people they were stunned to know cartilidan literally means cavity and i had a joke when i when i start teaching next time when you are visiting a dentist suppose someone tells you the dentist tells you you have two cavities if you already know the literal meaning you can apply you can respond to the dentist you mean that i have two cartilages the dentist may say no you are confused i am telling that you have two cavities you may insist that's what i mean i have two cartilages this is a joke that i use in my teaching what are they explain datura when it was introduced to india is quite a puzzle whether it got introduced only in the last 500 years when the europeans arrived to india or whether it got introduced much before that because whatever we know as datura is associated with lord nataraja in his dancing force whether that flower is datura itself or something else this remains as a puzzle but my concern here is the etymology of datura it's a linnean genus name and linnaeus was very partial to greek and latin languages and he was very reluctant to use the indian terms or any other term but he did use as long there is something a close term in latin you know the sanskrit term datura something causing hallucination something causing illusion 
And since there is a Latin term called a data giver, and in Indian time it was believed that the seeds of Dattora could enhance one's sexual potency. Giver. For that reason, Linnaeus accepted Datura but modified as Datura derived from the Latin term data. The reason I am mentioning is this. For flora of North America, I have to derive, I have to give the etymology. Sophora, a legume, it also occurs in India. You will not find the meaning what I am going to tell you, unless you have heard from me before. Linnaeus in 1751 in his Prasafica Botanica merely said an Asiatic term. When you say Asiatic term, Asia is a very big continent from where? He was reluctant to say it was from Arabia. Nevertheless, what does the term Sushira means in Arabic? He didn't say anything except mentioning it was an Asiatic term. I always let look for I get several ancient classical literature to look for etymology. Then I checked it is Hortus Cliffordianus, published in 1737. There, the second paragraph gives the Latin version, the bottom version gives the translation. In Sephora, he was calling the ten, ten stamens as wise man. I was totally confused. Why is he calling the ten stamens in the flower as wise man? I couldn't make out. Then I consulted a Latin teacher. Even though we know the what the Latin text given by Linnaeus mean, I simply could not understand what why he was calling the ten stamens as wise man. Then a Latin teacher explained to me, no. Here the wise man was used as a teasing term, as a critical term. The word in English, pun, P-U-E-N, pun, meaning not real. The moment the Latin teacher mentioned that Linnaeus, Linnaeus was not appreciating, but was critical, I understood the meaning. In Sephora, the Corolla is Papilinaceous, whereas the ten stamens are free. Like just like in Cisalpinia idea. So here is a situation, it is intermediate between Papulina idea and Cisalpinia idea. So Linnaeus was worried where to put that genus. So that's why he was very critical where to place. And he used the term Sephora, wise man. But in reality, he was critical of that terminal arrangement. And again, when I give talks, I ask people, what is the nature of stamens in Papillion idea? Yes, many people readily say, monodophus or diadophus. So far, good. Then I ask them, what is the literal meaning of adolphus? So far, not even one person told me the literal meaning of adolphus. They are able to describe, but not the real meaning, until, unless I tell them. Literal meaning of adolphus is brothers. Not man, nothing about group. Literal meaning is brothers. Man and first brothers in one group. What I'm telling is, you know what it means, but you do not pay attention to know the real, literal, original meaning. Whatever I mentioned is elaborated. This is not applicable to Indian flora. Matilia and aposinacea genus, the reason I am showing this to you is, I always go an extra mile, extra kilometer to understand certain things. Matilia was a genus published in 1775 by a French botanist, Aubrey, from a country called French Guyana. In his book, Flora of French Guyana, he has described a few hundred genera for many of them, he did not give the etymology. So no one knew what Matila means, Matilia means. I contacted several people. They told me, Kanchi, you are not the first person trying to know the meaning. 
Before you, for the last 150 years, many people, well, they were just puzzled. But beyond that, except telling it's an unknown meaning, derivation unknown, we couldn't proceed anywhere. But I continued to check. Then two botanists came up with this information. There is another similar term called Amatalia in French Guyanese language for the genus Cissus, which grows along the river, a riparian genus. The moment I came to know that, immediately realized maybe Matilia is an anagram of Amatalia because Matilia also grows along the river bank. It's only a speculation. At least there is some, some logic in interpreting that meaning. So what I'm telling is, I didn't give up. I went an extra, we say in American expression, mind, extra mind to learn something. And not only me, another botanist in Brazil came up with the same, same idea that probably Matilia is an anagram of Amatalia. This is just for a teasing. As I'm, as I'm giving talks, I teach people. I said, 150 years ago, even a bullock cart or a horse carriage can be called bus. Any vehicle that was transporting public was called omnibus or omnibus, a vehicle for everyone. So I tell people, so along with botanical knowledge, I also, I also share some general knowledge stuff. How many of you even know, whatever you call as bus, the full name is omnibus. That's the full term, but short term to bus. And 150 years ago, a bullock cart that was available for renting could have been called as omnibus. And here is a US issued stamp, US government issued stamp showing a horse carriage as bus, omnibus. This is just for your gentlemen. <laughs> and in my teaching, I just teach certain, certain very basic things in Latin. So now, there is so much information, I can go on for the whole day. But since of, of the time limitation and I have to catch a flight, so I will restrict myself to whatever I can talk in this remaining time. So people ask me, why it is genus nova? Why it is species nova? Why it is genera nova? The same term nova can be plural and neuter, and the same term Nova can be singular and feminine. So these are the things that I explain in my nomenclature teaching. So now, this is a lot, but again, I tell people, in order to learn something about names, please learn something about what is a nominative case, what is a genetic case. So in every nomenclature class, I train people how to coin name, how to coin a family name, how to coin a compound term. And I tell people, this is not a rocket science. The moment you learn the very basic, yes, in every class, wherever I talk, people learn the basic. It's a third declension. So now, I'm in a hurry. There are five declensions in Latin, and the third declension is the largest one. And any genus name ending in IS even today, there has been dispute, controversy. What is the genitive ending of IS ending generic name? Is it IS itself, just like in the genus name, why it is the grape genus? Or is it ITIS, as you find in hydrocharities? Or is it IDIS, as you find in orchids? So like that, there has been in some cases, it's straightforward. In some cases, scholars differ. And what do you do in such cases when scholars differ? 
we just go with the majority we just go with the majority as discussed in the normal crisis session and whether it's right or wrong the majority decided and we accept that's what i meant then like you may be surprised to know for the genus name cannabis at least there were four different family name in the past and the fourth and the court finally settled with cannabisi so now cannabisi is the correct family name as far the court is concerned nothing else when i was a student i learned caparis caparis belong to the family caparidaceae you know it's derived from the genus name caparis ending in is but later on the court settled it as caparidaceae so those who opted for caparidis the genetic form is caparidis and those who opted for caparidaceae the genetic form is caparis itself so again scholars they differed in their opinion and again the majority opinion within the normal cases section prevailed so now about psychas asclepias najas i tell people the genetic form ends with ad so that's why it's psychedaceae from psychadaceae asclepidaceae from asclepiadaceae najadaceae from najadaceae the moment i tell one thing immediately the people in the audi in the session they understand now if you look at flora of british india you may find that you may find that whatever is accepted now was not practiced then look at the genetic names ending with ma usually it is neuter occasionally it is feminine and whatever example i have listed on the screen they are all neuter look at melastoma malabatrica melastoma is neuter malabatrica is feminine and it was used by linnaeus linnaeus himself how can how can linnaeus commit such a mistake Malabatrica is a feminine adjective word. Whereas Melastoma, Stoma, any name, genus name ending Stoma is neuter. So likewise, several people like White and Arna, Bali, they have committed what we consider today as grammatical mistake. So this is what we keep on correcting as ortho orthographical errors, and we move on. And anyway, since i have already talked you know there is so much there is so much that i can share with you but because of the time limitation i have to end but since 2013 i have been visiting india almost every year traveling all over india and sharing my knowledge many times i spend my money occasionally my department support me sometimes they question me why we should pay you to go to india or why you are spending your money i said india gave me education the basic education so i want something to india and whenever whenever i see something like conservation i just want to make one comment at harvard we have more than 5 million specimens in one place 5.4 million specimen we have many talks at harvard about conservation when people come and say we have sacrificed to some extent to save some plants we have done this and that so that we have we are enduring little hardship to create sustainability then when i'm sitting in the audience then i make a i deliberately make a comment yes you have sacrificed but you didn't forego the very basic thing very basic what is a, a shelter to live under to drink water to have food this you have electricity 
These are the basic things you didn't forego. You might have forgone some luxurious things, but look at India. There are millions of people who do not have the very basic thing. How we can ask them to forego the very basic thing, then contribute to conservation? I said there is a big difference. Then they realize, yes, what they have sacrificed is little when compared to what people, poor people, go through elsewhere. So always I think about India whenever I see comparable situation at Harvard. Thank you again. Thank you. Sorry, because the time is a factor. So I have to rush. The next speaker in this session, I have, we have two more speakers. The next speaker in this session is Dr. Balakrishna Pishpati. He will uh, deliver his lecture on uh, how will ethnobotnia taxonomy be practiced in 2050. Dr. Pishpati is an internationally renowned young conservation and developmental specialist with three, with three decades of experience at the national and international levels, holding senior positions, such as Vice Chancellor of the Transdisciplinary University, uh, Chief of the Biodiversity Law and, Law and Governance Programs at UNEP, Senior Policy Fellow of FNI Norway, Chairman National Biodiversity Authority Government of India, and uh, Coordinator of the Biodiplomacy Program at UNU. United Nations University, Japan, and head a regional biodiversity program for Asia at the World Conservation Union, IUCN. He has been an advisor to several international bodies, such as the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development, the UN Secretary General Task Force on Technology Mechanism and others, and currently he is the chairperson of the Forum for Law, Environment, Development and Governance based in India. I once again proudly invite Dr. Pishpati, who is the chairman of the research council of the Jawaharlal Tropical Botanical Garden, to deliver his lecture, 20 minutes lecture, on the subject, how will ethnobotany and taxonomy be practiced in 2015. Dr. Pishpati, please. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Prakash Kumar, uh, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, experts. And of course, it will be a little bit of a, a different uh, take compared to the previous lectures of what I'm going to be speaking about. But the background to this is, is very simple because, uh, as Dr. Prakash Kumar was saying, a lot of time I spend talking to people who actually are policymakers and negotiators who decide on the future of conservation agenda globally. For almost 10 years, I was uh, heading the multilateral environmental agreements uh, unit at UN Environment Program, where my responsibility was to work with these non-experts. People have very little knowledge of the science of many of these things, but make global policies that impact to a large extent the way we do things. So what I'm going to be speaking to you about is the kind of developments, the kind of thinking that is currently happening in the context of shaping the future global conservation agenda. In the morning, I mentioned about a new 10-year strategy that is being discussed today. It will be negotiated by 196 countries in October this year in China. There will be an agreement for how countries need to work on conservation 2021 to 2030. But very unfortunately, the current text that is available for negotiations that will be negotiated in Rome starting on the 24th of February, which is the second meeting of the negotiating group, there is any hard, it is hardly any focus on taxonomy and there is very little to deal with the kind of science that a lot of you are practicing. And it's a bit of a concern because many times science is guided and to an extent dictated and also regulated by policy. So my intent here is that looking at how thinking is happening globally and what are the new developments, 
how do we make some of these things relevant to those discussions, especially for people who make policy, people who actually are looking at some of these, all the interaction between people and planet and, and, and plants. But to a large extent, this particular science has been suggested, practiced, promoted, encouraged, and subscribed by people who have very, very specific interests in groups of plants that contribute to something which is very, very special. But today, we are in a situation where we need to redefine what we are trying to do so that it makes sense to those people who actually are the ones making decisions, but to the common public out there who needs to be with us as we pursue this particular science. That's why I say that change is imminent, the way we understand and we practice taxonomy and ethnobotany today, and we actually need to look into the future from what we are doing currently and what we have done in the past. And if I'm going to be making one uh, element of understanding ethnobiology, the way I put it there, is that that's how it all started. It starts as semantics, as the art of religion, where culture and linguistics shape this particular science to a large extent, supported by biology and anthropology. To a large extent, anthropology provided a lot of backing and a lot of support in the initial stages of evolutions in ethnobiology, ethnobotany, ethnozoology, where ecology and the management of natural resources was something which was very, very dominant. And subsequently, biology came into having a larger role to play in subsuming some of these kinds of entities and interests, where the focus was on agronomy, focus was on genetics, and diversity and evolution. So to a large extent, there has been change, there has been an evolution, and we've already accepted and agreed that each of it had contributed, or each discipline had contributed to the evolution of ethnobiology, what we are today. But two elements that are very, very particularly interesting as we move forward into the next decade or two, in dealing with the relevance of ethnobiology, that includes the practice of taxonomy as an imminent element of ethnobiology, are those which are on the screen. One is how do we deal with the issue of cognitive knowledge that looks at society and practices, which actually was the founding principle within which we started working, and natural history that looked at both a non-human environment relationship, but also the relationship between humans and non-human environment as well. So certainly, if you're going to be looking at that element of experience, ethnobiology actually had treated science quite differently. I would really clearly said science as not definitive, but as predictive. That's how we started. And it was based on postulates that got tested, that got retested, and that also got redefined. So certainly, change in the way we have looked at this element of it was something not new. So if it is not new then, why should it be not new now on, is a question that we should ask ourselves. So for ethnobiology, very clearly, science need not always be true. That's how we started, and that's how the entire science had evolved in the past. But knowledge is true, and that's how we actually have practiced and developed this entire bit of science and the experience was as important as logic and reason. And that's a big difference between the way science is understood, practiced, and taught now to the way science was understood, practiced, and learned, experienced by people in the past, which really led to the foundations, the way communities over centuries have actually developed the way of not just identifying plants or animals, but also being a part of that particular ecosystem. Today, we have a new term, we coined a new term called ecosystem-based approach to conservation. But for millennia, communities actually have practiced ecosystem-based adaptation. We are only giving certain principles now to redefine of what they already have known. So if you'll be looking at some of those considerations, one of the very fundamental, one of the very clear requirements as we go into the future of ethnobiology that includes uh, taxonomy, is that we actually have started looking at it in terms of recording myths, the religious practices, the spiritual beliefs, economic activities, the kinship associations. And we actually have moved along to look at it from a very strictly cognitive or a scientific knowledge of plants and animals. And that is a huge shift in the way we actually have understood or practiced ethnobiology to what we are now. 
And if one considers ecological anthropology as a major contributor to this particular science, what has happened is that somewhere in the past, and especially in the current situation now, the traditional culture-based research had given away to effects of modernization. So today, ecological anthropology is more to deal with modernization than with traditional cultures. And that transition is also helping, and to a certain extent also not helping the way we deal with uh, ethnobiology. And if one is going to be looking at the tracing changes in biodiversity, essentially that's where the collections come into play a role. So collections are not just as reference material, but collections also are some things that actually tell us on how a lot of these changes have happened, both ancient and also recent. And today, one is going to be looking at whether we are looking at climate change, whether we are looking at disaster management, whether we are looking at uh, conservation. To a large extent, the community-based knowledge is something which is being recognized. And that is where we actually need to re-look at the way we are looking at some of those collections that includes the Hiberia, not as static elements that are collected and put on the shelf, but also as repositories of knowledge that has transcended over a period of time. And that kind of a change in the perception and the way we look at the cultural elements of uh, collections to the current and the future requirements of biodiversity, whether it is related to botany or zoology, needs to be looked at. The question is, are taxonomists or is taxonomy servicing this part? And that is something which is being questioned because there was, there was a mention of the relevance of taxonomy today. It's not nobody is questioning the relevance of taxonomy. It's the difficulty to understand that taxonomists have contributed a lot of knowledge about knowing the species. And species exist, but there is a huge challenge of saving those species. So should the investment be on saving those species that are known than to actually invest in knowing more and more species? So, challenge for a non-expert who doesn't know anything about biodiversity, who doesn't know anything about taxonomy, is a very fundamental question of where are the priorities, where should I put that money. And that's why if you look at the evolution of ethnobotany, one assessment could be that it started as a sub-discipline of anthropology, it became a part of ecological sciences, and today ethnobotany can only survive and be relevant and is currently being discussed in the context of both economic botany and sustainable resource management. I'll give you one example. As and when we are discussing, for example, the, the threatened species, red listing species. IUCN, for example, as you know, have been working on this for many years. And the way IUCN looked at red listing classification, the relevance of red listing to 20 years ago to what it is today has completely changed in the way actually they relate to the work of threatened species listing and categorization. Earlier it was more for conservation purpose, but today it's more for development purpose. So the practice is to an extent the same, but the relevance and application of some of the results of the practice is something which is going to be changing and that needs to change. And one of the other important elements to a large extent forgotten in the context of ethnobiology is the role of psychology. Today, as I mentioned, a large volume of interest is being shown in the way people behave towards nature and biodiversity. It's completely a new area for work for conservationists globally. And as I said, that even the Convention on Biological Diversity will have a discussion meeting on this in terms of how conservation psychology, behavioral sciences is going to be contributing to the way we are going to be either achieving or not achieving the new set of global biodiversity targets. And the problem with ethnobiology and traditional ecological knowledge is that a significant part of it has been procedural. And analytical language is difficult to use when we are discussing many aspects of ethnobiology, which actually was a, an element of an issue. And links with psychology for using and applying procedure and knowledge will be needed. And today, unless we are able to el integrate elements of some of these discussions in the way we are understanding and applying elements into, into ethnobiology, definitely the future of ethnobiology is something where we basically will be questioned. And value in ethnobiology, or ethnobotany for that matter, is Looking at the cognitive behavior is looking at the cognitive dimension of ethnobotany in itself. And that's how ethnobotany had evolved in, 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 the long, in the long run. And anybody working in conservation, the issues of cognitive science or behavioral sciences is something which is very new. Because we never looked at those two elements as contributing to the way we are practicing conservation, we are using, we are misusing, or we are overusing conservation, uh, bio, biodiversity or natural resources. 
Today, cooperative science is something which is shaping the way governments and individual institutions are trying to develop policies on conservation and development. And that's why the Convention on Biological Diversity, as I said before, is focusing on this element of behavioral sciences in the biodiversity agenda. There was a mention of the UNCCD, the UN uh, Convention to Combat Desertification Corp, the Conference of Parties that India hosted a few months ago uh, uh, in Delhi. And for the first time, this particular convention, again, with no experts in taxonomy, with no experts in psychology or cooperative or behavioral sciences, recognized and had a part of a declaration that came out of this particular conference that looked at how nature is viewed by human groups through a, a screen of beliefs and knowledge, and how humans have used images to articulate and manage natural resources, including land. And when this particular agenda was taken up for discussion, there was a huge kind of, a, not just an interest, but also a disbelief among the negotiators that what has this to do with the UN Convention's agenda to push forward the way we manage our land and the way we manage our resources. And to an extent, that is a change in the way people have started looking at use of some of the elements and principles of ethnobiology. And that's where, today when you're talking of cognitive studies or cognitive science, Target 17 of the newly drafted biodiversity agenda, biodiversity targets that are going to be discussed in October this year, has a very, very important dimension that also will come up with a set of indicators in conservation that will look at the issue of cognitive science in conservation. And that's why the local communities have really gave us a lot of interest, a lot of uh, interesting ideas in terms of how they actually have looked at some of it. To them, the only extent they need to know the world is where their knowledge stands to. So in view of the culture eliminates the interaction between cognitive and social processes is something which needs to basically be integrated in the way we understand and the way we practice some of this. So if one is going to be considering some of these unrelated and often confusing elements of dimensions or developments that are happening, in the way people look at conservation, in the way people look at ethnobiology or, 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 or taxonomy, what is the future that we are looking at? Where are we trying to go? I have a, a few uh, examples uh, in terms of how things are emerging. Many of you probably would have read this paper which calls ethnogenomics. And there was a mention of DNA barcoding in the morning. And today it is definitely science that is taking shape in the way we are trying to deal with taxonomic knowledge improvement also. In terms of how some of these terms are not being coined, but how some of the very modern ways of dealing with identification of species is also taking shape. The second example from ethnogenomics, in terms of uh, where the field taxonomists and the traditional knowledge experts have contributed to the way we understood taxonomy of, uh, of trichogon species. And the reason I mention it is that it is not that that particular science of molecular biology is static, it is evolving, but on the other hand, the application of some of these uh, scientific developments in modern uh, taxonomy and ethnobiology is also improving. Many of you are aware of the UN declaration that 2021 to 2030 is called the International Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And today, one is going to ask the question on restore to what? <coughs> you can restore, but what is the benchmarking that you are going to have to restore to what? And that is where ethnobiology has a larger role to play in terms of defining what has been in the past so that we can understand. So in other words, to make ourselves relevant in terms of what we do within the ethnobiology practice, these are some of the opportunities that we have in terms of applying some of the principles and knowledge that we have at the international level. That's what I, I, I say as redefining or repositioning ourselves in the way we do it. In terms of indigenous people and local communities, SDG 16 on rule of law. Today, ethnobiology practices, ethnobiology experience, and the way local and traditional communities are dealing with this is shaping the international agenda. We have a whole declaration of the UN on, on indigenous people. And where does all that come from? It actually came from our collective experience of dealing with ethnobiology. But how many of us understand the contribution of traditional knowledge to rule of law? How many of us understand the current ongoing discussions on human rights and environment in the context of ethnobiology? Do we have to teach them? Of course we have to teach the students because this is going to be the future in which some of these things are going to be uh, looked at. Billion dollar industry, fashion technology. My daughter studies fashion technology and today she is doing a project exactly on the role of ethnobiology in emerging fashion. And today there is a new concept called slow fashion. And the entire concept of fashion technology in the fashion 
industry is based on the issue of ethno ethnobiology and ethnoscience. The entire convention is based on our requirements of dealing with some of these issues. The objectives of the convention, conservation, sustainable use, access and benefit sharing, the whole protocol on Nagoya, which is related to access and benefit sharing, the new targets, all of them have something to deal with. So if you're going to be looking at the new dimensions and where we are going to be positioning ourselves in 2030 or 2050, those are some of the issues which are directly relevant to ethnobotany and ethnobiology. It's about cognitive behavior that looks at the social dimensions of it. It's about ethics, equity, and human rights that looks at both the issue of social and environmental dimensions, and also nature-based solutions. The entire talk that is going to happen, the Conference of Parties on Climate Change this year, is going to focus on nature-based solutions. And the nature-based solution examples, the experiences, where are they going to come from? They are going to come from ethnobiology. But are we making ethnobiology relevant to some of those discussions is a question that we need to ask. And that's where the policy dimension comes to play a role. And that's where the environmental experiences from the, the ethnobiological uh, field uh, helps the environmental dimensions in terms of experiences, adaptive management, adaptive behavior, and also need to recognition. And in terms of the social dimensions, that is looking at commons, that is looking at knowledge management and dealing with change. Today, everybody talks about sustainable development goals, sustainable development goal number 15 and 14, but to what extent have we related the work that we are doing to deal with some of these issues is a question we need to ask. And the entire issue of bioprospecting, the entire issue of new business and enterprise models, and also the dimensions of intellectual property rights and benefit sharing. And today in law, there is hardly any reference to some of those elements that actually have emanated from the practices of ethnobiology. And that's my last slide to say the best way to predict the future is to create it. If we are not able to be relating some of these, they look completely unrelated to a lot of us in this room because we never looked at it from that perspective. But globally, and for many countries, these are the emerging areas in which they actually want to reposition and to redefine and make taxonomy, make ethnobiology more relevant. Because at the end of the day, it's not the practice that defines the future, but it is what the society expects the practice to do that is going to be defining the future. Thank you very much. Friends, the last. Uh, lecture in this session is by one of the finest botanists of the country, Professor C.R. Babu. His 20 minutes lecture will be concentrating on the taxonomy in digital world. I request Professor C.R. Babu to deliver the lecture. As everyone is aware, Dr. Babu was a faculty member of the Department of Botany at the University of Kerala, sorry, University of Delhi for more than 35 years. That was my wish. wish. He was the founder director of the Center for Environment Management of Degraded Ecosystems and uh, School of Environment Studies of the University of Delhi. I'm not reading out everything. He is presently the Professor Emeritus of the University of Delhi and Distinguished Professor of the Environment Ecology, Environment and Ecology of the School of Human Ecology. Project Director of the Center for, Ex Center of Excellence Program of the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change Government of India at the University of Delhi, and project in charge of the Biodiversity Parks Program of Delhi Development Authority at the University of Delhi. His major areas of interest include conservation biology, biodiversity, and genetic resources, environmental ecosystem, ecosystem restoration, ecosystem dynamics and functions, and systematics. And he has an experience more than 40 years on this. Dr. Babu, he is the recipient of the Indira Gandhi Padiyavaran Puraskar of the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Vaspi Kadam Award of the, for the Environment, Science and Technology and the Narendra Award for Conservation of Nature. With great respect, I invite Professor Babu to deliver his lecture on taxonomy in digital world. this uh, session. Let me thank uh, BSI for inviting me to participate in this conference. 
As usual, I decided to attend the conference at 11th hour. With result, I made my slides in Hadid way. There are a couple of typographical errors, and please uh, pardon me on that. I present my talk on taxonomy in the digital world. And I talk about the digital world, please do not take it that it is only digitization of your collections. It includes information technology and based upon the, the computer uh, models. Okay. Uh, my first slide tells you a paradox. What is this paradox? We are living in the era of mass species extinctions on one hand. And on the other hand, we are planning to colonize other planets in the universe, in the universe system, including Mars and Moon. This is just a paradox. You just think of it. I'm not going to explain on this. Information and space technologies revolutionize our entire communication system. In today's world, digital technologies are quite powerful in generating knowledge and use that knowledge for the benefit of mankind. In such a digital world, what is the future of taxonomy? Does it survive in its present state? Or evolve into an abstract science? In my opinion, the taxon in its present form survives, but it will increasingly use models for generating the knowledge and use it for the benefit of mankind through practical realization of the three goals of CBD, which our Mark Christian just now narrated. I will not repeat it. Now the question comes is, in the first lecture by Professor Cole, he almost told you that the traditional taxonomy is threatened. A day may come, if all of you are silent like this, you may find traditional taxonomy is replaced by another group of another taxonomy, candlestick taxonomy, where you see only the telegrams are piloted pictures. So therefore, I just want to tell you how we would defend our traditional taxonomy how we can argue and convince the entire world that traditional taxonomy is entirely different from statistics and traditional taxonomy as a practical value. For that, I brought into a world what you call concept proposed by world famous evolutionary biologist that is Huxley. Huxley recognized Three evolutionary process leading to the evolution of species. Find it. Evolution of species. These three processes are cardio, sorry, anagenesis, cardiogenesis, and what you call stachygenesis. What is meant by anagenesis? Anagenesis refers to the biological improvement of a population over the ancestral population as a result of adaptation to the changing environment. The product of paradigms is called date. What is paradigms? Paradigms refers to the putting or divergence of this biologically improved population over the ancestral population. Now this product of paradigms is called date. What is a claim? A claim is nothing but a reproductive isolated 
what you call great. Now, what I want to say is, now, what about statinsis? Statinsis refers to the persistence of the species evolved. There is also another evolutionary process, which he did not recognize as a, a separate evolutionary process, that is extinction. He did not recognize extinction as a separate evolutionary process because any failure to persist is the extinction. If a species cannot persist, and it will undergo extinction. Now, what I want to say in a very simplified way, not going into complications. A species is an evolutionary product. And recognition of that species is the basis for any knowledge, what you call, created in, in any biological sense. Find it. Whose job is this? This is the job of a taxonomist who recognizes species by a simple criterion. What is that criterion? That's a remarkable and unique feature of taxonomy which does not have any, what you call, comparison in any other, what you call, discipline. That is, discontinuities, presence of discontinuities in a set of correlated morphological characters will result in the recognition of populations of the species. Now, this species, what we call, is a taxonomic species or a, a conventional species. What is the uniqueness of such species? And what is what is strength of this conventional taxonomy? This particular species recognized by conventional taxonomy corresponds to the biological species where the reproductive isolation is, has taken place. It not only corresponds to the biological species, but it also corresponds to all the species today are recognized based upon the ecological attributes or molecular attributes. And this alone depends that the alpha tech, the conventional taxonomy is very strong and it will never be threatened by Cladish or any other group of what you call taxonomy that could come into future. Now I just want to tell you now I want to I'm not a critic, but when I look at the arguments given by the Tadish, which I think probably uh, elaborated by Carl, I just want to tell you poor Tadish, the taxonomist, a group of taxonomists called by themselves, called themselves as a Tadish, been phylogenetic trees. What you call the cladograms. Based upon what? Based upon the phonetic characters. When I say phonetic, which includes morphology as well as physiological and biochemical, and also molecular variations. Now, based upon this phonetic trees, they classify individuals as a species. And it is a remarkable difference between a cladist and a class conventional taxonomist. A conventional taxonomist recognizes population of the species as a real entity in the nature. But a cladist, based upon the variations among the individuals, the individuals are classified as a species. Now, this led to what you call a massive increase in the number of species, which is often described today, inflation in the species number. And this alone 
made many ball against that there should be a regulation on taxonomies in this having a new species, which calls off as dice they operate. I'm not going to. The reason is any divert, divergent form from a node is discovered as a new species. Let me tell you, you have a crop. Today, in India, we have a three times more crops than the what the original species is had. I was there a few days ago in Calcutta where a conference, international conference was organized at Calcutta University. One taxonomist, I won't name it, found two times higher species of cucumber. Cucumis. Now all these need to inflate in the number of species and let me tell you, these species do not correspond to what exists in the nature. So what is the practicality of the thing? What do you call of taxonomy? The practicality of taxonomy is lost and we have simply a positive decrease. In other words, if I want to identify a species in the, my field, I must carry what you call a PCR, or I must carry something else so that I can take and then study it and then see whether the profile matches or not. On the other hand, in alpha taxon, in, in conventional taxonomy, I just can identify very easily looking at the characteristic features, pathological features. It's very easy, and then I use it my purpose, and then I can utilize that identification for a variety of purposes. Uh, what I want to say to you is now, based on this so called Puketu phylogenetic trees, the colonists have been changing the circumscription, I need circumscription, and the limitation of the taxonomy group recognized based upon the conventional taxonomy. What the next result is? How these classifications are based by tradition? I'm not against tradition, but I'm telling you the approach as a follow. The classification proposed by tradition are single character, unitary character, what you call classification. What is that? Divergence from a single node. What it means? Monophage. Nothing else. They can only classify the groups where there's a monophage exists. And what is that monophony? It's, a, it's, it's assumed, not on a practical reality that what exists there. So, therefore, what I want to say is such grouping is artificial and what you call and not natural. When your grouping is art artificial, your classification has no productive value. Again. What is the unique feature of conventional taxonomy grouping. The unique feature is the classification proposal based upon the conventional species concept has a very high productive value. If I bring any plant species or any, any one individual plant, I can simply assign it. Yes, it belongs to this species, it belongs to this family, it belongs to that. This cannot be done at ease with what you call all right. What I want to say is, we generate knowledge, but that knowledge is meant for who? For whom? And for what? That knowledge must be put to use for the benefit of mankind. How? Through what you call implementation of the three goals of CBD, that is conservation, sustainable utilization, and benefit sharing out of using the, what you call, sustainable utilization of the resources. To do that, we need conventional taxon, not the eclatist taxon. As I already told you, eclatist taxonomy is based on a pretend to phylogeny, so-called, 
what you call poisoning is used to stay high. What I understand is that kinokodesi and our intensity are much because using a monophyletic character. But to me it appears both are quite different. Morphologically, you can distinguish very easily and still it's very easy to utilize the knowledge that is generated by using conventional taxonomy to utilize the species that are recognized in these two families for, for, for the benefit of mankind. The reason why I've told this is there are unique species which can be used for a variety of what you call for addressing a variety of environmental problems. For example, I have one species which can change the, which can change the pH in 24 hours from 12 to 7. I did not find any other species. How? How I found out? It is because of my what you call conventional taxonomic knowledge. And I won't mention the name of like that. We found out several species which can be used for the bioremediation of what you call contaminated soils, the groundwater, including the what you call surface water. Um, I would tell you something. And then at that stage, I uh, I already told you taxonomy in its present form survives, but it will increase, increasingly use computer models. That provides what you call a new dimension to the taxonomy. You ask me, can you give an example? If I want to know the distribution of one endemic species reported from one locality, I want to know whether this species is really endemic to that locality or it is found in many other areas in India or outside India. Taxonomists have to what you call survey all the area and then after three years they'll say yes it is found in Malaysia or somewhere else or it's not found there. But if you utilize ecological niche model, find it, you can predict very easily this entire distribution range by using a computer model. Yes. Using the ecological niche model. Now, we have been, I think the DBT has sponsored an All India Coordinated Project under this what you call coordinatorship of IREC, and they found out that many rare species are now found wide, what you call, occurrences within the country. A big difference has come out. So, therefore, taxonomists must try to utilize these computer based models to what you call, to give a new dimension. I'll give you one more example. I used to attend the lectures given by Omar Shankar from Bangalore University. And initially, I thought, what is talking all about? Okay. But later on, I found, using a simple computer models, you can find out in what groups you can create more new species. In what groups you expect plants have a high what do you call bioprospecting value? And in what groups you find X chemical compound? All this can be done by using a computer model. And so therefore, we I suggest that the conventional taxonomists should increasingly use the computer models or divide the computer models to give a new dimension to the alpha taxonomy so that the alpha taxonomy has a direct bearing, what they call, to the society. I want to summarize it. I will not go into the details. In my opinion, taxonomy is dynamic science and it remains as a dynamic science as long as human beings survive on this planet. Thank you very much.
and Dr. Balakishnati. See, now all the, the, the lectures are over. Now the session is open for a discussion. Dr. Ganji Gandhi is to leave early. So quickly two questions to him. If anybody has two questions, you can ask him. And uh, we have to leave him early. No questions? Okay. But conquest uh, adopted the spelling Hama Mary D. Which one is correct? Please. As I mentioned in my earlier the ID, I guess, is the derivative ending. Thank you. Station program. May I request Professor Call to kindly felicitate Dr. K. N. Gandhi, sir. Thank you, sir, for accepting the token of appreciation. Can we have a huge round of applause? Thank you. Can we have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? The remaining three speakers are here. If the audience want to have a discussion with them, we can proceed. In, in case of, uh, whereas today morning, one of the uh, lead lecture, uh, the esteemed professor said that uh, some of the Indian publications were rejected because we are not using molecular techniques in systematic classification. So I have a doubt. Since I am a beginner in doing research concerned with traditional knowledge and botany, please clarify my doubt. मुझे ये जो चार लेक्चर्स हुए उनको संक्षेप में संक्षिप्त करने का मुझे जिम्मेदारी दी गई है बड़ा मुश्किल काम है 
लेकिन मैं कोशिश कर रहा हूँ कुछ बड़े शब्दों में संक्षिप्त में कि जो बातें मेरे को समझ में आई उस तरह से मैं आपके सम्मुख रख रहा हूँ प्रोफेसर कॉल उन्होंने बदलते सामाजिक परिवेश में पारंपरिक जो तो एक्सोनॉमी हमारी है उसको किस तरह से एक नई दिशा देने की आज जरूरत है उस पर उन्होंने बहुत विस्तार से प्रकाश डाला ये प्राचीन विद्या थी और बहुत उतार चढ़ाव से ये गुजरी है और आज के इस वातावरण में वो बहुत उतार चढ़ाव से गुजर भी रही है आवश्यकता इस बात की है कि हम इस विधा को इस ज्ञान को हम सामाजिक आवश्यकताओं से जोड़ें और अगर हम ऐसा कर सकें तो जो संरक्षण वनस्पति संपदा संरक्षण की जो बात है और जो हमारा एक पर्पज है जो हेतु है शायद वो संभव हो सके उन्होंने बहुत खूबसूरती से सिस्टमेटिक्स को बायो सिस्टमेटिक्स से किस तरह से हम उसको इंटीग्रेट कर सकते हैं किस तरह से जोड़ सकते हैं और किस तरह से हम इसको नई रोशनी में हम पुरानी इस पुराने ज्ञान को पुरानी जो तो हमारी विद्या है उसको किस तरह से नई रोशनी देख सकते हैं इसके उन्होंने प्रकाश किया प्रोफेसर गांधी ने जेनरिक नामों के उद्भव और उनकी उत्पत्ति का एक बहुत सुंदर विवरण हमारे सम्मुख रखा अनन्य उदाहरणों से उन्होंने इसको हमको समझाने की कोशिश की हाइड्रोकोटाइल हथोरा सोफोरा एमेटीरिया जैसे उन्होंने जेनरा का नाम हमारे सामने रखा और विस्तृत जानकारी हमको उन्होंने मौजूद कराई उन्होंने अलग अलग विभिन्न कारकों और विभिन्न जो विभक्तियाँ हमारे पास हैं कर्ता कारक हैं कर्म कारक हैं संबंध कारक हैं संविधान कारक हैं उनके जरिए से उनके माध्यम से और जेनरिक नामों को किस तरह से उद्भव हुआ और किस तरह से उनकी उत्पत्ति हुई उस पर उन्होंने बहुत सुंदर व्याख्या हमारे साथ रखी डॉक्टर बालाकृष्ण ने हमको इथनो बॉटनी के बारे में अवगत कराया सदियों से एक वनस्पति की जो हमारी संपदा रही उसके संरक्षण में सर्वाधिक महत्वपूर्ण होते हुए भी वो एक जटिल रास्तों से जटिल मार्ग से वो गुजर रही है और इस तरह की जो उसकी विकास की यात्रा है उस यात्रा में हमको जुड़ना होगा और जो एंथ्रोपोलॉजी है और जो इकोनॉमिक बॉटनी है वो किस तरह से विकसित हुई शुरू शुरू में वो एक एंथ्रोपोलॉजी का हिस्सा रही फिर उस समय बाद समय के उस अंतराल में वो इकोलॉजी में शामिल हुई फिर वो इकोनॉमिक बॉटनी में पढ़ाई जाने लगी लेकिन आज हम उसकी उसके महत्व को आज हम अच्छी तरह से समझते हैं अगर हमें इस संपदा को हमें सुरक्षित रखना है कंजर्वेशन को हमें महत्वता देनी है तो हमें उसको फिर से समझना होगा और उसको एक संपूर्ण विज्ञान के रूप में उसको विकसित करना होगा ग्लोबल बायोडाइवर्सिटी फ्रेमवर्क ने इसीलिए उसको एक महत्वपूर्ण स्थान दिया है उन्होंने सस्टेनेबल गोल के बारे में ही बताया कि किस तरह से इतनो बटनी हमारे उन सस्टेनेबल गोल्स को परिपूर्ण करने में एक महत्वपूर्ण रोल एक महत्वपूर्ण योगदान दे सकती है उन्होंने बायो प्रोस्पेक्टिंग को हमारे सम्मुख रखा और उन्होंने एक्सोनॉमिस्ट पे रिपोजिशनिंग की बात हमारे सामने रखी प्रोफेसर सी आर सर ने हमारे सम्मुख एक बहुत महत्वपूर्ण विषय एक बहुत रोचक विषय रखा कि ये जो हमारी विद्या है जो ट्रेडिशनल है जो पारंपरिक है क्या वो आज के दौर में वो जिंदा रहेगी भी कि नहीं क्या डिजिटल संसार में ट्रेडिशनल टेक्सोनॉमी का कोई महत्व होगा कि नहीं उनका ये पूरा भरोसा है कि नहीं उसकी महत्वता बनी रहेगी चाहे डिजिटल वर्ल्ड चाहे इंटेलिजेंस आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस का चाहे कितना भी ये विकास क्यों ना हो लेकिन वो जो ट्रेडिशनल जो हमारा पारंपरिक जो टेक्सोनॉमी का जो प्रोसीजर है विस्पीसीज को जो हमें आइडेंटिफाई करने का जो स्पेसीज का जो कंसेप्ट है वो हमेशा जिंदा रहे उन्होंने क्लेटिस्टिक्स के आधार पर ये बताया कि बायोइनफॉर्मेटिक्स टूल्स ने क्लेटिस्टिक्स को किस तरह से एक प्रैक्टिकल टेक्सोनॉमी में कन्वर्ट किया लेकिन ये जो मॉलिकुलर क्लेटिस्टिक्स है इसने एक स्पेसीज को कितनी ही स्पेसीज में बदल दिया बल्कि बहुत सारी ऐसी स्पेसीज उन्होंने हमारे समूह रखी 
जो संसार में कुदरत में पिकड़ती हैं तो अस्तित्व ही नहीं धराती हैं स्तित्व ही नहीं रखती हैं ऐसे में उन्होंने हमारे सामने ये जो पैराडॉक्स है इस पैराडॉक्स को हम किस तरह से हल कर सकते हैं किस तरह से हम ट्रेडिशनल टेक्सोनॉमी को हम की मदद से हम इस इस पैराडॉक्स हल कर सकते हैं इसका उन्होंने भरोसा दिलाया और उनका ये कहना था कि जो ट्रेडिशनल टेक्सोनॉमी है वो अभी भी रॉबस्ट है अपनी जगह सुरक्षित है और हमें कहीं भी किसी भी तरह से संदेह की और घबराने की कोई आवश्यकता नहीं थैंक यू सो मच Thank you, sir. We will now have the felicitation program for our speakers with mementos and certificates, which will be followed by the felicitation of the chair and the co-chair of this session. May I request our chair, Dr. R. Prakash, to kindly felicitate Professor A. K. Paul. May I call Professor A. K. Paul? to kindly accept the token of appreciation please thank you sir for accepting the token of appreciation can we have a huge round of applause ladies and gentlemen now may i request our co-chair mr s n tyagi to kindly felicitate dr bala krishnan so thank you sir for accepting the token of appreciation <coughs> can we have a huge round of applause ladies and gentlemen Now may I request our co-chair again, Mr. S. N. Tyagi, to kindly felicitate Professor C. R. Babu, please. May I call upon Professor C. R. Babu to kindly accept the token of appreciation? Thank you, sir, for accepting the token of appreciation. We can have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Now I would like to request engineer AK Patak sir scientist GBSI to kindly felicitate the chair Dr Prakash Kumar director TBGRI Kerala may I call upon sir to kindly do the honors Thank you sir for accepting the token of appreciation can we have a huge round of applause ladies and gentlemen Now I would like to invite Dr M Sanjapa S director BSI to kindly felicitate our co-chair for the session Mr S N Tyagi May I request Sanjapa sir to kindly do the honors Thank you sir for accepting the token of appreciation may we have a huge round of applause ladies and gentlemen Thank you Sanjeev sir for doing the honors thank you so much Now ladies and gentlemen we will break for lunch for our for an hour and after the lunch all the participants are requested to go for